Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. For many, prayer feels like leaving a message for God on his voicemail, and faith is hoping he checks his messages. We will explore the new covenant basis for listening prayer, the practice of engaging God in conversation as the face-to-face fellowship of intimate friends. Now, here's Brad. Our God is not someone we talk about who's in another room. The Lord Jesus is here. We declare the kingdom of God is here and the king is here. And so even right now, I'm just going to invite Jesus to go ahead and start moving down the rows. And uh, while I'm talking, he'll be coming through and he'll be laying his wounded hand on your hearts. And I don't know if you'll feel that or not. Some of you probably will. And uh, whether you do or don't, that doesn't matter because he, he will do it. And so, Lord Jesus, why don't you just go ahead and do that? And would you begin laying your healing hands on us, your hands of blessing, your hands of life? And that that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit to hear, hear your voice more clearly. Some of you... You really want to experience God, but maybe you expect that will feel like getting zapped and you've never been zapped. And so maybe you think I've never experienced God and I mean, but, but do you feel the peace in the room right now? Lord, we welcome your peace. There's a supernatural stillness that Jesus is dispensing right now. It would be good for us to not call that nothing. Peace is the Holy Spirit's favorite way to minister. I found that out just by experience. And 95% of the time when the Holy Spirit comes, he begins with his beautiful peace. So just uh, if we could be like boys and girls waiting for a gift, if you want to even hold your hands out. So Lord Jesus, that your spirit of peace would rest on us now. And that even striving to try to be spiritual, that we could just let that go. We release that to you and we welcome peace. We thank you for your presence and and we ask uh, that you would even increase our awareness of your presence. So we're open, we're attentive, we're watchful. It's as we be still that we know he's God. And Lord, we apologize wherever we've taken your peace for granted. People are paying a lot of money for peace on street corners and in pharmacies and in counseling clinics. And we just thank you. You would dispense it freely to us like this. And we welcome it and we ask for even more now. There's a million other voices in the world, but beneath that clatter and that cacophony of sound, there's a still small voice that comes to us in peace. Let's just, uh, let's just listen to that voice. Lord Jesus, is there anything that your still small voice would want to whisper to my heart right now? Just go ahead and listen.
Now, he may speak words or thoughts, or he may just let you soak in the peace like a good sauna. And just enjoy it. And if you're having a Jesus moment, just stay there. And, and, uh, but you're also welcome to come along with me and listen as we talk a little bit. So I want to lay down a couple of foundational scriptures on hearing God. This will be our general session on hearing. Uh, but I, I have some, some things that I feel like God wanted me to specifically share for this group. So first of all, in terms of a foundation for hearing God, I want you to, I want you to uh, learn two little verses that m- if any of you went to Sunday school, you would have learned them by the time you were four. And what I want to say is that these are actual foundations of our faith. And I'm so committed to them and convinced of them that I feel like the harder we lean on them, the the more sturdy they are. See, I got a little wobble here, but if I lean on that even more, I'm not going to fall. It's uh, okay. Now, now this is solid. And there's a couple phrases in scripture that I found the harder you lean on them, the more they manifest in your life. Here's the first one, Jeremiah 33.3, God's phone number. And we may even only need to learn the first half of it, but I'll let you in on the rest. And it goes like this. When you call on me, I will answer. No, really. And so... uh, most of you have heard that verse. And, and what I'm saying is that that's like, that's true. And it was from the voice of God himself. And not only was it from the voice of God himself, he says it in the prophecies of Jeremiah of the new covenant, which means it's a promise that Jesus died for on the same level as he forgives your sins. This is, this is a promise written in Jesus' blood. If you call on him, he will answer you. No, really. And not only that, but in Jeremiah 33, verse 2, it's the verse right before that. God says something extremely redundant. He says, Thus says the Lord, who made the world, the Lord, who uh, formed it to establish it, The Lord, that's his name. What's going on there? He's saying, thus says the Lord, I swear on my own holy name, the name that Jews fear to say, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. He does a threefold oath on his own name, and that means take him seriously. What he's about to say is reliable. It's so reliable, he will bet his his son's life on it. He will give his son's life on it. And here's the promise. If you call on him, he will answer you. No, really. I learned this little liturgy in Wales that we do. We made it up. So uh, we're going to do some liturgy together. Simple. Liturgy is when you pray together in agreement. I'm going to say... When you call on me and I'll have you say, I will answer you. Okay. And then I will say, no, really. And then you will say, yes, really. Can we do that? That'd be cheesy and fun. Okay. But we need to get this thing in our hearts because it's a new covenant promise written in Christ's blood. So when you call on me, I will answer. No, really? Okay, some of you are too cool to participate. So the rest of you just need to like make up for that, okay? So let's do it again. When you call on me, I will answer you. No, really? Okay, so this means when I go to pray and I call on the Lord, it is not just that he will hear me. He says he will answer you. This is not like leaving a voicemail for God. Prayer is not like giving a, 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 you know, sending an off an email and hoping he'll check his inbox. 
This is not like when I go online or on, onto the telephone with, with someone from like, let's say Revenue Canada, and I, I get a series of operators that are recorded messages. That's not what's happening. God says, swearing on his own name three times in his new covenant blood. If you call on him, you get a live voice. And he has put that voice in your heart. He has installed that voice in your heart. And, the, and when the whole, the whole Old Testament refers to the Holy Spirit, they weren't thinking third person of the Trinity, were they? Jews didn't think that way. What they were thinking of was the voice of God. And so under the new covenant, Jeremiah says, the voice of God is going to be installed in all of you. In your heart, you will have audio connection to heaven all the time. So that when you call on him, you should expect an answer. You should expect it. And when you don't get an answer, you should be alarmed and, and say, okay, what's wrong? Something's off today. I'm not hearing. It should not be like this just like a special occasion where you have a supernatural experience and you get zapped with his voice. It's more like a daily life of an ongoing conversation with a living friend who is with you always and never leaving. Isn't that what Jesus said? That prayer becomes a real meeting with a living friend. And when you call on him and he answers you, the rest of the verse says, and I will show you show you that's about seeing things then too, right? Not just hearing, but seeing. I will show you in your hearts. I will show you what? I will show you great and mighty things which you did not know. In other words, as we open our hearts to God, as we put our confidence in Christ, and as we lean hard on this promise that when I call on him, every time I pray, I'm getting someone real and alive is responding to me, then, well, that means a few things. I'm going to find out stuff I didn't even know. But also, it means that I should probably be giving him a turn, right? I should be giving him a turn to talk when I pray. And so we call this listening prayer. Listening prayer is not like a technical thing. It's, it's more like when you pray, it's the time during prayer when you do the listening. Listening prayer. And so when I, when I pray now, I, I'm learning that uh, it's a little bit like going on a date. If you go on a date and you do all the talking, that's called narcissism. If you pray and you do all the talking, no wonder it's boring. But if you go out on a date with your best friend and you know that they have things to tell you that you didn't even know, you will become attentive and you become a listener and you'll, 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 be, you'll be open to hearing what they want to say so that you can get to know them. There's no way to get to know a friend unless you listen to them. I, you can know a lot about your friend by reading about them. Uh, I have friends who have biographies written about them, but the fact that, that, I, that I read their biographies or even their memoirs does not mean that I know them, and it certainly doesn't mean I have a personal relationship. When does our relationship become personal? When does it become relational? It's as we get in conversation, and as I start asking questions about them. So, how many kids do you have? And the Lord's like, ah, oh, about a billion right now, right? It's like, what are you into? Have you ever asked God, what, you know, what are you into? How do you become, how do you become friends with someone? Mainly, well, if you're good at it, you, you ask questions and you listen. If you're having trouble making friends, you might want, you might want to check if you're doing all the talking. I found that uh, people like to be friends with those who ask questions and listen. And, and God would love it if you would come and ask him questions and then listen. In fact, the Old Testament kings that were regarded as the good kings were the ones who inquired of the Lord. Do you know what that means? Inquired of the Lord means you ask him questions and then you listen. So, 
That's our first foundational verse. It's so basic, but and it's not like you even need more understanding on it. What I'm saying is that that it would just do us well to remember that and then lean on it and see what happens and then even insist on it and say, Lord, uh, you, you know, your word says in, in, in the sort of the 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 blood passages. It's, it says you're going to answer me. So I need an answer. Would you speak to me? That means giving significant time to dialing down to finding that place of peace and then, and then see what comes to mind at the level of the still small voice. Let's do one more uh, foundational passage. This one I learned really young. Maybe I was three. Maybe it's news to some of you, but um, <clears throat> but the, the, we're going to pick one phrase from the passage and then we'll do the whole passage again. So here's the phrase from the passage from John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice. He doesn't say my sheep could hear my voice or should hear my voice or might hear my voice. He says my sheep actually hear my voice. And that's just a fact, a fact. If you are one of Jesus' sheep, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're into Jesus, then you cannot tell me you don't hear him. Because Jesus says you do. And, And maybe you don't believe you hear him. Maybe you don't give time to hearing him. Maybe you don't count all the ways he's already talking to you. But I'm I'm just saying, Jesus says you're hearing him. And and so this is good news. He he in fact he doesn't say you you could you could hear him if or you will hear him after or any sort of set of hoops that you would need to jump through. Uh, that's just not. It's just not there. In fact, we make up ways about why, why people can't hear them that aren't true. So, for example, um, sometimes we think, well, maybe it's the mature Christians that hear him. Well, then that wouldn't make it a new covenant promise. That would be like saying it's the mature Christians whose sins are forgiven. No, your sins are forgiven from day one because it's new covenant, right? When you come to Jesus and and you first give your life to him and and you say, will you forgive my sins or what do I have to do to earn it? It's like nothing. You can't earn it. This is an absolute gift and he forgives your sins. Did you know that? What I'm saying is that because hearing God is a new covenant promise, it's the same way. You don't get mature enough to hear God's voice. It's a gift. In fact, uh, what we practice in our church is the very first thing we do when we lead someone to Christ. I mean, the very first thing in the first five minutes is we teach them how to hear God's voice because that's a gift that they are given the moment they give their lives to Christ. In fact, usually they've already heard his voice calling them into his family. And so if I have a chance to disciple someone in the first five minutes, they're going to learn two things from me. One, when you call on me, I answer you. And my sheep hear my voice. That way, Jesus becomes part of the discipling process. That way, Jesus can go to work with them. Tell you a funny story about that. Uh, my friend Brian West, he, he, uh, he called me one day and he, he, he said, I just led a couple to the Lord. And it was like the first converts in our little church plant, right? And he said, I have no idea what to do, how to disciple them. I don't know where to start. And I'm like, why? What's the problem? And he said, well, first of all, they're third generation unchurched. They don't know anything. They don't even know what the word pray means. They've never been in a church, never opened a Bible, didn't know that Jesus was a person. They they knew it was a good swear word, but, you know, like nothing. Plus, uh, they're living as a couple. They're not married and have a child. Um, So on top of that, the way they provide for themselves are they like they're drug dealers and drug users. And he's like, where do you start? They'd come to him and they said, uh, our lives are falling apart and we need help. And, he, and, and then he said, well, what you need to do is you need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And they said, okay, <laughs> they had no idea what that meant, but he led them in a little prayer, you know, Oh Jesus, we need your help. And so now he's saying to me, and now we disciple them. Well, what do you do? 
And what he didn't want to do is say, you know, well, okay, uh, first of all, you need to get married and you need to stop doing drugs and you need to stop dealing drugs. And you need to, it's about like, just, are we going to give them a bunch of commandments? So uh, I said, okay, I'll meet you at the coffee shop and, and we'll try and figure something out. So Brian and I met this couple and, uh, and Brian was in the zone that day. You know, he had been in desperate when he called me, but he had an idea. And he said, let's teach them that they can hear God for themselves. That way, then God can do the discipling. And maybe he'll know where to start. So he sat down in this coffee shop and Brian says, okay, the first thing we want you to know is that when somebody says yes to Jesus, you become like his sheep and you're his shepherd. And they're like, okay, whatever. They said, and here's what you need to know. My sheep hear my voice. So you're going to start hearing God's voice. And they get like freaked out. We're going to hear a voice. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. But it's a good voice. It's a good voice. God wants to be your shepherd and he will guide you. You get to hear his voice because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And they kind of just believed him. And, uh, and then he said, now here's the other thing. When you call on him, he'll answer you. Okay, so we're two minutes in dis- dis- discipleship, right? When you call on him, he'll answer you. So what we're going to do is we're going to call on him. And then he's going to answer you. Really? Yes. And they kind of just believed him. And, uh, and so Brian says, uh, okay, God. We're calling on you now. Would you tell this couple where we need to start? And so they, clo- uh, they, they asked, do you close your eyes or what do you do? They didn't know about this stuff. So they well, if it helps you. So they did. They closed their eyes. And they listen. And you see, they're expecting the Bible to be true now. They're putting confidence in the promise. They're beginning to lean in to this idea that if you call on him, he'll answer you. And, and, and the girl suddenly says, oh, I have a question. And we're like, well, that might have been the Lord telling us where to start, right? And she said, okay, well, my question is, are Ouija boards okay? And we're like, ugh. Great. We already got 14 commandments if you include the drug dealing and stuff. Now we're going to add in thou shalt not use Ouija boards, right? But it's a really significant question in context, isn't it? We're talking about hearing God. We're talking about getting information that you can't have naturally. We're talking about reaching out for revelation that would be supernatural. And what comes to mind? She wants to know if Ouija boards are okay. For those who don't know it, Ouija boards are, are, are a game that was put out. It's like a game board, and then you've got letters on the game board, and then you, you start asking spirits of dead people to show up and start moving the pieces around the game board to spell out answers. And so people buy this hoping to get information from spirits. So she actually, she was on the right track in this sense. It's not about you figuring it out. You are going to need to access revelation that goes beyond the answers that have failed you already. Right? So Brian did a great thing. He kind of lied. When she asked, are Ouija boards okay? Here's what he said. I don't know. Why don't you ask Jesus? And what he actually, it was only kind of lied. Because what he meant was, I don't know what to tell you without making this about the law. I don't know how to launch discipleship without making it about all the fences and boundaries and thou shalt not. I don't know what to say, right? So in, in fact, he wasn't really lying, but he says, I don't know, why don't you ask Jesus? Because here's two things we know. My sheep hear my voice, and if you call on him, he'll answer you. And so now these very fresh, very raw, drug-dealing, drug-using Christians have to look to God and and, and now this is their first time calling. And so the girl says to to Brian, so how do I do that? And he says, well, just ask him. It's like out loud. It's like, if you want to. So she closes her eyes and bows her heads again. And she says, "Uh, uh, Jesus, 
are Ouija boards okay? Like, like totally open to anything she's going to hear. And we're like full on holding our breath. What's he going to say? Right? And then she does this. She says, oh. Oh, okay. And then she's like, oh, happy. And they're like, what did he say? Do you want to know? Okay. <laughs> so I'll replay her side with his voice in it. Jesus, are Ouija boards okay? And then he says, Ouija boards put chains on you called fear of the future. Oh. And that's not freedom, but I've come to set you free. Oh, okay. Isn't that clever? Jesus found a way to say no to Ouija boards in, so that it was not a thou shalt not. Without restraining her freedom, in fact, she perceived it correctly that it would preserve her freedom to stay away from them. That it was not God about to put this restriction on her. It was God guarding her heart from a bondage and restriction. It was like unbelievable. I'm like, you're so smart. We couldn't believe it. And, and you know what? That was for her, but it was also for us. Our confidence that God would speak in the moment, even to a brand new, fresh believer went through the roof. And you know what? If, if she had heard something wacky, that's what we're there for. You know, we're there to help weigh and test what we're hearing. We work together to discern whether uh, the content of what, of what that revelation is, is on or not. And, and when it's not, we can say so. It's like, no, that didn't sound like Jesus. Let's, uh, let's work it out, you know? And so, uh, but I have this feeling that we're not very confident in that. Even when I'm sharing the gospel now, I'm discovering the glory of the fact that if I'm telling someone about Jesus, why would I do it as if he's not here? If I want to introduce someone to Jesus, why not just say, you know what, he's like, he's right beside me. If, if, uh, if, if my fr best friend is right beside me, why would I just talk about him all the time to someone? Why don't I just introduce them? Bob, Jesus, Jesus, Bob, would you like to know him? And, and the thing is, it, it's, it's as if like he's gone somewhere. I'm like, no, no, he's right here. And I know you can't see him with your eyes, but if you open the eyes of your heart, um, I can introduce you. So just go ahead and close your eyes. And we do this all the time. Now we just have people close their eyes and I'll say, okay, now, now Jesus, would you show them yourself that you're right here in front of them? And like, do you see him? Oh yeah. All the time. They're like, I, yeah, I, see, I mean, I see. Yeah, they're having a vision of Jesus like that. And then, and then I don't even have to tell them the gospel half the time. What, what I'll say is this. Jesus, would you go ahead and tell them the good news? And I said, you, just in your heart, just look at Jesus and, and listen to what he says. Because he's going to tell you the good news. And then you tell me and I'll do the quality control. And they will say crazy things like, for example, oh, I, um, uh, you know, he's saying, I love that part. He's saying, yes, he's talking to them. We called on him and what did he do? He answered them. No, really? Okay. And so the good news might sound like this. It sounds like the things that happened to you when you were a little girl weren't your fault. And I want to take and wash all of that stuff that would never come off in the shower. And I want to give you a new white, re clean robe. I'm like, wow, that's good news. And he's going after healing right away. We've heard that so many times. He will, he will say things like, I know. And then begin to weep and to sob. Because they know what he knows and yet he loves them and they can see that he cares. 
And so I, I, what I'm wanting to do here is I want to stir up your faith that it's actually true that when we call on him, he'll answer and that his sheep will really hear his voice. Now, sometimes we get nervous about that because uh, um, we have fear of deception. And I get that because there's a deceiver out there right now. But I need to warn you about something. Fear of deception opens the door to deception. Confidence in Christ closes the door to deception. Jesus is more confident in your ability to discern than you are. Know how I know that? Let's go back to John 10. Here's the whole text, starting at verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Who's the thief and the robber? The devil, the devil, yeah. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Okay, I know it's obvious, but who's the shepherd of the sheep? Jesus, okay. To him, the shepherd, the doorkeeper opens. Who's the doorkeeper that opens the door for the shepherd? That's trickier. Well, you could say the Holy Spirit. So you could say the Holy Spirit opens the door for the shepherd to come. Um, Another translation says the watchman opens the door, which in the Old Testament is a code for prophetic people. So there were prophets who would open the door for the Lord to come speak to the people. Right? And now what we find out in the new covenant is that all God's people are prophets. So every one of you has an opportunity that you are part of a royal priesthood that serves the whole world. So the the church is not its own thing. The church is just like the priesthood that serves the world. And as priests, as watchmen, as porters, as doorkeepers, we open the door for Jesus to come through to call people by name, to speak to them. And so even right now, if I'm doing my job, I'm, this will partly be about that I'm a doorkeeper and I want to, I'm not to be the voice of God to you. That's not my job. What I'm to do is I'm to be a doorkeeper who through my words, through what I'm sharing, opens the door so that Jesus comes to you in person and that you hear him for yourselves. So he says, uh, the doorkeeper opens the door or the gate and the sheep hear his voice, the shepherd's voice. The sheep hear the shepherd's voice. My sheep hear my voice. And he calls his own sheep by name. And he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, the shepherd goes before them and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They know his voice. So so it's not just that my sheep hear my voice. It's that you as sheep, you actually do recognize his voice. Uh, If I were to say, you know, how many of you, when God speaks, that you know it's his voice, you recognize his voice. Some of you would maybe be timid and not put your hands up. Some of you would, you know, you, you know you do, but you don't want to show off. And some of you, like, really don't think you know. You don't. And I'm saying, yeah, you do. Or unless Jesus is wrong. Is Jesus ever wrong? Are you his sheep? Do you recognize his voice? Uh, I I don't know. Maybe. And, And so I would come to him and I'd say, hang on a second. I know what you're saying, but that's not my experience. Some of you, you would, to be honest, you'd say, that's not my experience. And then what I think Jesus wants us to know is, well, then get an experience. Uh, it's sort of like, well, at least this is what's on the table. I want, you to, I want you to come to this table where you do recognize my voice. I want to train you how to learn to recognize my voice and distinguish it from the other voices so that, let's check out this. He says, the sheep will by no means follow the stranger, but will flee from the stranger 
for they do not know the voice of the stranger. In other words, he's really confident that when God speaks, you'll follow him. When the, when the thief, the robber, and the stranger, the false teacher, the false prophet speak, you won't, you won't follow them. You'll run away from them because it's a different voice. And you'll be able to tell one voice from the other. Wouldn't you like that? Well, it's promised in red letters in John 10. So if it's promised, but you're not, but you're not there yet, well, that's why we have these seminars. It's to grow in our capacity just to discern the voice of Jesus from the other competing voices and to, to run away from those voices. Let's, uh, let's pause and experiment for a minute. If it's true that God's sheep hear his voice, if it's true that when we call on him, he answers, if it's true that my job is to open the door so he can speak to you, wouldn't it be silly to just talk about it? Um, and so we want to we want to basically do a little exercise here. And some of you, you may not be able to step into it immediately because um, because you're, the, you're wired to have to dial down for half an hour. You know, and, and if I put you on the spot, you'll go into trying too hard and then it just won't work. So, so the most important thing is, is to be at peace right now before we listen to his voice. I want to, um, maybe we should describe that first. What is the posture of listening to God? What is the posture of listening to God? There's this really, it's, there's a funny German word. It'll sound like someone sneezed. And, and the word is Galassenheit. It's not Gesundheit. It's Galassenheit. G-E-L-L-A-S-E-N-H-E-I-T. Galassenheit. And Galassenheit describes the posture of a good listener. It describes the posture of someone who's ready to hear God. And so if I could just um, sort of give you a picture of where that is in, in your emotional, spiritual space for best listening, this might help. Let's make a spectrum. On this end of the spectrum, we're going to have like apathy. And on this end of the spectrum... We're going to have striving. Now, and in the middle, middle we're going to have Galassenheit, which I'll say more about in a moment. But on the apathy end of it, you have believers who we don't really seek to hear him. We don't care to hear him. Or maybe we're even a little stubborn and say, well, if he has something to say, he can say it. Or when we pray, maybe we believe in our hearts that he would speak. But if we never give him a chance to, then it's sort of like, uh, if I could use a, a picture, be like just coming to God with a limp wrist. Okay, So I'm this sort of limp wrist, apathetic, or maybe it's like I tried it and I tried it and I can't do it and I despair. So the apathy, despair, uh, being so passive that you're not engaging and participating in the conversation. So much so that prayer has stopped being a dialogue or even maybe never was one because you didn't know. And so in terms of a, a conversation with God, we, we become just like, like limp wristed and give up. The other end is maybe where some of you are more familiar with this. And that is we, 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 we hear songs in, 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 that we sing and we, we say we do courses and, and, and worship, but we also have teaching. And especially in revivalism, there's a call to press in. Press. I'm going to use language that some of you may have used. And, and okay, uh, full disclosure, I've used this. But I want to show you how it can go sideways. So when we talk about pressing in for a breakthrough... What am I, see my fist now. This isn't a limp wrist anymore, is it? But it's a clenched fist. And it's like, I need to, I need to go deep. I need to really, um, what are other words we'd use for it? Well, how about spiritual constipation? Oh God, you can get a laxative for that, you know? Oh, it's like, is that how you talk to your wife? 
Oh, honey, would you just like pass the salt, please? Hey, oh, let's snuggle. And you're like, lighten up, Francis. You know, and we get, we get, and it, but what happens is the language of pressing in can actually send you into striving. And nothing shuts you down like trying too hard. You cannot open up while you're striving and pressing in for your, you know, it, and, and, and we crunch our foreheads and we clench our buttocks and, you're, and, and the Lord's like, oh boy, what am I going to do? <laughs> and and it's, it's like comical, but it's calm. And, and, and often we even regard it as super spiritual. But theologically, hang on a second, when we talk about having to press in for a breakthrough, are we not raising the veil up that Jesus already died to remove? Press through what? The veil is open. Walk in. And yes, there'll be times when we need to press through uh, and break through our own junk, our own culture, our own opposition, our own, you know, we have stuff in us that really needs to go, right? But, but in terms of access to the Father, uh, in terms of hearing the voice of God, I, I'm just saying some, sometimes it's harder to hear when your fist is clenched. And then what we find out is that in, it, there, there's this sweet spot in the middle. Um, Galassenheit would literally mean like releasement. Releasement. It would be uh, sometimes we'd call it a contemplative openness. It kind of finds the middle where, on the one hand, you're not apathetic because you're attentive, but but you're not all clenched up because you're open. So attentive, open expectancy, and the image then is not a limp wrist or a clenched fist, but open hands and a raised face. Oh God. What do you have for me today? I'm I'm open. I'm expectant. I, I'm I'm ready to hear anything you have for me. I'm not striving. I I, I I'm settled down and I, I'm ready to receive. But I'm focused. My eyes are on you. My eyes are on the throne of grace. Oh, what's the good thing you have for me today? And if we could get into that Galassadite zone when, when we pray and just, just uh, use worship then to open us up. And uh, some folks w- worry about getting too open because, you know, if you open up to God, you open up to everything. And it's not like that. It's more like a direction. When I open towards God, I'm a closing towards everything else. So it's not, it's not about open close. It's more about um, as I'm postured towards him in expectancy. The other thing about hearing is that it's not just audio. Uh, when I come to the Lord and I want to, and I want to receive from him, I want to hear from him. I'm not only listening for a voice, but I'm looking for a face. And I'll say just very quickly, a few of the scriptures about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 4, we read that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, and that now, now, we all, we all with unveiled faces open, right? When we turn to the Lord, there's the direction, we turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And we all with unveiled faces behold, that means look on purpose with the eyes of your heart. We behold the glory of God and it transfigures us. That's what the the scripture literally says there. Transfigures us. Like remember the Mount of Transfiguration? As we behold the glory of God, as we look on purpose with the eyes of our heart into the glory of God, we are changed from glory to glory into the image of Christ. What changes you? What makes you more Christ-like? Trying harder? Pressing in? No, no, no. What what changes you from glory to glory into the image of Christ is looking at the glory of God with an unveiled face. And and then 2 Corinthians 4, if you just keep reading, it will tell you where the glory of God is seen. You know where it's seen? In the face of Jesus Christ. 
So I behold, I look on purpose with the eyes of my heart into the face of Jesus Christ as part of my prayer discipline. And I open up to him and I'm like, Lord, I want to see your face. We sing that, right? Well, we should do it sometime. I want to know you. I want to see your face. I want to hear your voice. And we've been singing this for years, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. So we, I mean, the hymn writer knew it. And I'm just like, when do we do that though? Do we just sing about it or we do it? Let's do it, right? So what I'm going to invite you to then is that, uh, that, that now that we would turn to the Lord with unveiled faces and with the eyes of our heart wide open, I invite you to look in his face and that may be very visual or it may be more like a sense, a sense of looking in his face. And we're going to call on him. And, and when, I, when we call on him, what, was, what does he do? He answers you. Okay, so we're, so we're going to look to his face. We're going to hear his voice. And we're going to ask him, Lord Jesus, we, we're calling on you. And would you answer us on this one? Okay. So, uh, and I'm going to ask him a couple questions. So hopefully I'm going to just like open his door and the shepherd will come speak to the sheep if I've done my job right. And, and like I say, don't stress if you can't go there in a moment. You may need to go get a CD. Put some headphones on. Give God an hour. It's not that he's slow. He's going as fast as you can go. All right. So let's pray. So when we pray, get to Galassian height. Open your hearts to him. Turn your face to him. On the one hand, focus and be attentive. But on the other hand, be open and receptive. And as best you can, fix your eyes on Jesus, as as Hebrews 12 commands us. Fix your eyes on Jesus. As Paul prays, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened that you could behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And I just welcome, I welcome the smiling, loving, caring face of Jesus that shows us the character of God. We, I pray that his face would shine on you now. Lord, make your face to shine on us with the glory of your redeeming love. As you look into his face, I'd invite you just to ponder what expression do you see on his face? What if you could see his face, and and, and many of you can, if what expression would be there? Just take a moment to look at how he's looking at you. When you gaze on him, he gazes back at you and he sees you. Hagar said this, I have seen the God who sees me. Jesus, for those of us who are in Christ, how much more we ask for that. We open ourselves to see the God who sees us. To see the face of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you think about the expression that you see in his face, if you, if you look at, if you look at how his eyes are looking at you, what message does that face send you? You know, faces communicate, don't they? What is his face communicating to you right now? And Lord, I, I, I want to call on you and I have a question that I, I would I, would, I just uh, ask that you would answer this question for my brothers and sisters here. Jesus, how do you feel about me? Uh, 
watch his face or listen for his voice and see how he responds. Because when you call on him, he answers you. Jesus, how do you feel about me? And now we're, we're even going to tailor make the gospel for you that, you know, G, there is, there is one gospel and that is that Jesus came, died for you, rose to life and, and now comes and, and he's, he saved you. He saved you. Uh, but when he talks about that, he tailor makes it for our lives. So he said for the lepers is it, it's, they'd be cleansed and the blind would see and the deaf would hear and the poor would have good news preached to them. I wonder how he would tailor make the good news for you. So let's ask him this as the follow-up question. Lord Jesus, I invite you to look at my life. I invite you to look at my heart. I invite you to see the the good and the bad, I invite you to see me as I really am. And I ask you to tell me what's the good news. Now, Lord Jesus, I I invite you to just to lay a hand of blessing on each son and each daughter here now. Just lay a hand of blessing. Just even the little boy or little girl inside that needs you to affirm them. You would release your healing love into their hearts and an affirmation. That you'd give them deep level senses of belonging. that you'd embrace them, that that, that they would feel your love for them today. Lord, if you just want to go ahead and if there's anything else you want to release to them, if there's, if you, if you would like to bring fresh freedom, just go for it. uh, Loosen bonds and burdens, remove them. Lord, if there's some washing and cleansing you want to do, just go ahead and do that with pure water that you'd cleanse their bodies and their consciences. Speak the word of forgiveness and release. Um, Lord, if we could get away with some like healings in their physical bodies, just whatever you want to dispense right now, we say be healed in Jesus name. And Lord, um, uh, most of all, I pray that you would, you would actually anoint this group to be able to give this teaching away. That they could set up meetings with you for their friends and loved ones, for people that are burdened, for people that are addicted, for people that are in need of salvation. Whatever it is that they would grow in their confidence that when they call you answer. Jesus' name, amen. I just want to say we, we found this exercise to be, it's like so simple, right? It's not rocket science. You can do this in a coffee shop in five minutes with someone where you say, hey, want to do a thought experiment? 
If you were to close your eyes and look in God's face and ask him how he feels about you, what would he say? Want to try it? Sure. Bam! And he starts speaking to them and he starts smiling on them and they begin sobbing. Or maybe they're like, huh, that didn't really work for me. Oh, cool experiment though. But what I'm saying is this has been fruitful and not only is it a thought experiment, it's a real encounter. And um, so I just want to finish up just uh, again by stirring your faith that what, what was happening just now in terms of encounter, if you, this, this is real. We're not modernists who don't believe in spiritual things. This, we're Christians who believe in having a spiritual life with Jesus. A Jesus who's called us to behold his face and listen to his voice. So as we practice that together, uh, I want to just admit I'm a skeptic. But here's the thing. I'm a convinced skeptic. Because after a few thousand times, you realize, oh, God meant it. After you see uh, God do his thing with people and, and begin to actually witness the ongoing fruit, if you will practice what we just did in some kind of regular way and say, hey, why shouldn't prayer start that way? Why not start my prayer? Like, okay, I'm going to pray now. Sit down, move to glass and height, open your heart, focus on Jesus and begin to listen. What a good way to pray. What I'm saying is it's not just a good way to pray. You watch the fruit. This will change everything. Some of you have been praying like this for years, and I've been hearing testimonies how it was absolutely transforming. I just want to give you a, a, let's see, I'll give you one example of why I moved from being a skeptic who feels like we're just making stuff up into a convinced skeptic who is willing to go for it in spite of my doubts. Um, as we practice these kind of things in, in, uh, in, in listening prayer, as we practice looking and listening, it, first of all, it, it began with inner healing. And we're going we're gonna to do a session on the kinds of ways that God uses, uh, uses this practice to bring healing, both physical healing and also spiritual healing. And, and emotional healing. And where it started for me is with working with, uh, with, with young people who had been molested as children. And some of them were absolutely stuck. They were in full-time care. And, and uh, or I mean like weekly visits to psychiatrists and, and, and uh, they were on medications and in therapy and so on. Some of them, uh, one who's I, I can I'm allowed to share about her name was Amanda, and for her it also went so far as a severe case of anorexia that had go, gone to a point where uh, her body was shutting down. She was sustaining heart damage. Her reproductive system had shut down. Um, her body thermostat was offline. She was growing hair she didn't want in places she didn't want. I mean, like all of the typical stuff with severe anorexia. And she, she just couldn't get free of it. And she was seeing a clinical counselor for this. And they're getting nowhere, right? She didn't know Jesus either. She was just coming to our youth group. And one day she came in and she was so desperate. And I said, well, can we do a thought experiment? Can we ask Jesus to come and meet you at the place where the root cause of this happened? And, 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 she, and then she confessed that she had been molested. And I said, would it be okay if I invited Jesus to that moment? And she said, sure. And I said, where do you see him? And she said, it's right after I've been molested. I'm out on a sidewalk and he's standing there and he's reaching out his hand to me. So I said, Jesus, would you take her hand? And he said, she said, he's saying, no, I need to take his. See, because she wasn't a Christian yet. And he, he's holding out his hand, making the offer, but she needs to respond. And I said, would you take his hand? And she said, oh, I'll try that. So she grabs his hand and, and she says, he scooped me up in my, his arms. And he's taking off the soiled clothing and the underwear and all that. And he's putting on fresh white dress. And, he's, and oh my goodness, he's washing the stain off. I could never get that stain off. And now she, and she's feeling whole. And I'm like, and, and how else are you feeling? The fear is gone. The anger is gone. The shame is gone. I just feel so good. And I feel like peace and I feel like love and I feel safe for the first time. 
And I'm like, this is awesome. My hair was standing up on end. I'm having hot flashes because I have my goosebumps. This is early in my career, you know, and I didn't know what I was doing. All I did, what is all I did? All I did was say, could Jesus come there? And then he totally hijacked the meeting and took over. What happens is she be, I, I said, um, so he, he took off, he, he took off your, the stain of this abuse. What if he could take off all your stains from every sin ever committed against you and every sin you've ever committed? Would you want that? Yes. Said so Jesus, would you do that? Yes. And he, and he immediately just cleanses her of it all. And then I said, how would you like him to be your best friend forever? Yes. Wait a minute. She's invited Jesus to be her best friend forever and, he, and asked him to remove all her sins and stains. Wait a minute. I think she just became a Christian. She goes back to her clinical counselor. And here's the funniest thing. Clinical counselor working with her anorexia was not a Christian, would not profess to be a Christian, but she's a professional. And he, she said, he wouldn't believe it. She goes, do you want to do a thought experiment? I said, and Amanda says, sure, I'll try. And she says, I want you to imagine climbing a mountain. You get to the top of a mountain and you're looking up from the top of the mountain and your best friend is there. Who's your best friend? She goes, Jesus. And the counselor goes, oh, yeah, that'll do. Get a load of that. An unbeliever saying, now I want you to look in Jesus' face and tell him how you feel and see what he says to you. And over the course of weeks, as this clinical counselor leads her in listening prayer, Amanda gets totally healed of her anorexia, set free. She gets her life back. She gets her reproductive system back. And now she's moved in across from me with her children 15 years later. It's like, yay, God! Well, what am I saying? I'm saying what we were doing here this morning, just the simple act of opening to him, looking in his face and hearing his voice is the active ingredient in the most profound healings I've ever seen. That's not to include the physical ones, but look at the fruit in Amanda's life. This changed everything. Uh, If you want more uh, details and all of that stuff, you know, where the bookstore is and all of that. Uh, But uh, but I think the bottom line is if you would just like start, maybe you've done this for years, but if you start there and then let Jesus lead it from there, he will actually teach you stuff that I couldn't find in books back in the day. And now, thank God, we live in an era when God's been releasing this teaching across the body of Christ. And there's a hunger for it all the way from like the... Uh, Eastern Orthodox Church with their, with, with their incense to like the hyper-renewal churches with their nonsense. I mean, everybody wants to hear. Everyone wants to hear. All right. Have a good day, you guys. Blessings. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at BreakForthMinistries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.